I'm 53 years old and an avid hunter, trapper, and fisherman. When I was 12, we had a family visit to Muir Woods National Monument in California. I was obsessed with steelhead. There was a stream full of them right next to the walking path. I left my family to get closer to the fish. I guess I was about 100 yards from my family when I rounded a bend in the stream. I climbed over a rock, and at about 30 yards a guy Sasquatch was squatted on the edge of the river. We locked eyes and it seemed like he was trying to kill me with a stare. As he stood up I could not believe how fast he moved. His hair was dark brown and his face only had hair around the edges. He kept his eyes on me as he literally stepped across the creek. I saw grayish hair on his back and muscles like a bodybuilder. The creek was like 20 feet across and he cleared it one hop. I could not get out of there fast enough. No one believed my story, not my parents, my brother, or anyone for that matter. Jump forward to the year 2000. I was married and living in northern New Jersey. I shot a huge buck one morning early and the arrow seemed a bit far back. I decided to give him some time. This was November and I was coaching football at the high school nearby. I went to the game with the intention of tracking the deer after the game. We followed the blood trail about 150 yards to where the deer died. You know what the ground looks like when a full kill deer expires. There was a 10-foot circle covered with blood and hair. The blood was like someone spilled a five-gallon pail, but no deer. The bears are huge here, but a bear would have chowed on that deer first, then dragged it a distance and either hit it or left to come back. There were no drag marks, no blood trail, nothing. But my carbon arrow was broken into little four or five inch pieces. During turkey season the following year, I was hunting behind my house every morning. There's about a square mile of private land. I kept jumping what I thought was a bear on the edge of a swamp at the base of a steep bridge. It happened several times in the dark. The bear would move up about 50 yards. It was always at first light and I was hoping to hear the turkeys gobble on the roost. One morning I was late getting out, so I was creeping slower than usual. An owl was hooting as I walked. When I got near the area where I was jumping the bear I steeped in owl feces. As I did I heard someone running toward the ridge. It was the thump, thump of a two-legged being. Their feet hit the ground, not the leaf shuffling a bear makes on the run. Then I saw it. It neared the top of the ridge taking huge strides. As it topped the ridge, all I could see was the same face staring at me from when I was 12. I knew what it was. I haven't slept right since. At our camp, about 20 miles from my home, we had a deer taken from inside of a pickup truck with a cap on it. The T-handles of the cap were closed but not locked. Whatever took the deer put its hands on the top of the cap and left marks, or the hair on its arms had disturbed the dust and the dirt. The guys I was hunting said a bear took it. How many bears can open the cap, walk away with the 100-pound doe, and leave no drag marks or evidence? One Saturday after deer season ended, I was driving at night at about 10 p.m. I came across a six-inch tree across the road that was just wide enough for one truck. I had just been there a few hours before in the daylight. I got out to move, but the tree had been twisted around five feet off the ground and bent over the road. As I looked at it, I felt like I was being watched. I had that feeling of impending doom swept over me. They did not want me there, so I jumped in my truck and got the hell out of there. I'm never going to stop what I love to do most, which is hunting and fishing. But it's not the same as it once was. You know you're not alone out there there. There's something about knowing that you're not the top dog in the woods. They walk around my house at night in the summer. When I'm out hunting, they're here and no one wants to admit it. The BFRO idiots were more concerned with having me pay $400 to get in on their freaking expedition than coming up to see the area where I live. As soon as I said they were human-like and not ape, they dismissed me like I never existed. I was chased by an unknown hairy bipedal creature outside my childhood home. This was rural northern Wisconsin and I was 16. Up until that day I had zero fear of the woods. 
I spent most of my time out there exploring and feared nothing. My parents had a lousy marriage and fought a lot, and I felt more at home outside than in the house. On hot nights, I'd take a sleeping bag and sleep on the roof of an old shack on our property. I saw bears, I saw wolves. They were always more afraid of me than me. I didn't believe in ghosts, Bigfoot, demons, or even God. I only got lost out there once when dark fell sooner than I expected. I stayed calm, found the North Star, and knew that if I continued south I'd eventually come across the old railroad tracks near my house. Even the thought of spending the night out there didn't bother me. The thought of my mom's rage when I didn't come home did. So it was summer, and I had just turned 16. My mom had left my father, father worked all the time, sister was living on her own. Once school was out it was me and my cat, and this is before the internet or smartphones. We lived on a dead-end dirt road and around noon, I took my usual stroll down the long driveway to check the mail. My cat followed me everywhere, and I actually kind of relied on him to give me a heads up if there was a bear or something close by. A bit of movement behind me as I stood at the mailbox made me aware there was something across the road in the trees, but there were pesky deer everywhere. I heard a loud crash like something very loudly making its way through the brush, it's like every classic horror story. My brain had no capability for the thought of anything paranormal or spooky. I simply tucked the mail under my arm and headed into the woods to investigate. My cat followed close behind. I got about 10 yards in when I noticed what I hadn't noticed before. There was no noise, nothing. It was a beautiful June day and there wasn't a single bird singing, no insects, no leaves rustling, it was absolutely silent. At the same time, I registered the silence. I got that eerie feeling that something was watching me. I stopped immediately and started scanning the woods for deer. Hunters know what I'm talking about when I say you look for the shape of a deer instead of trying to pinpoint them by color. That's when I spotted it. Two brown furry legs, the top of it concealed by tree branches. My cat hissed. I looked down and he was completely poofed out with his back arched. Looking at the same thing I was, I looked back up and the legs moved. Not like a deer, like a human. Everything happened at once after that. I dropped the mail, picked up my cat by the scruff and ran for it. Whatever was out there with me was running after me. I have never run so fast in my life. I tore up the driveway into the house, locked the door and grabbed the phone. I called my next door neighbor who was the ex-chief of police, and he came over immediately with his pistol. He checked out the spot I was in and found nothing. I was so hysterical I was in tears. He stayed with me until I was able to reach my mom and have her come get me. Of course they thought I was completely high or delusional. I know exactly what I saw and felt. It was broad daylight. I never felt safe in those woods again and stopped sleeping outside. Me 19 male and my friend 19 newbie were walking home from a walkout to in and out at around 10 to 11 something p.m. We decided to take a cut through that runs by a local food co-op and some railroad tracks situated behind the food co-op. The cut through would lead you straight to the railroad tracks behind the food co-op. As we approached the food co-op, I saw the silhouette of what looked like a man leaning or hunched over. Almost like how in some zombie media the zombies sleep hunched over while standing up or sort of like how some people on heavy amounts of opioids look as they're nodding off while standing up. Its head, face was facing the ground at a slant and its back was ever so slightly slumped, arched. At first I was just confused about why a man would just be hunched in front of the railroad tracks like that. Other than that I oddly enough thought nothing of it. I might have been a bit zoned out as I struggle with mental illness and I often zone out. Sometimes to the point where I just forget where I'm walking and whoever I'm walking with at the time has to direct me where to go. The meds don't help with not being all there mentally either. Although when working effectively they'll either reduce or completely suppress the chatter in my head that makes me zone out. Once it started to move into the light, I gradually started to realize something was off about it. 
I forget if it was moving in an odd way or not, but it just seemed off. This is when I started to realize something wasn't right. The figure had its arms stretched upward in a weird way. It looked lanky and its arms looked longer than they should be. Its proportions were just off. It looked semi-dark grayish. Once I saw the figure's arms long outstretched upwards and moving in an unnatural way. I paused for a second then told my friend to book it pretty sure I also yelled cryptid and we booked it to the part of the street that intersected with the closest street away, parallel from the street the co-op was on. I looked back in the direction the figure was first seen. It began approaching a person on a bike who was biking slowly in a sort of aimless way, slow to the point that he couldn't keep the bike steady and was sort of swerving to keep it upright. The person on the bike didn't seem to react, seemed to care, or simply wasn't concerned. At this point, the figure was practically on top of the person on the bike, and the person on the bike began slowly pedaling in our direction, still swerving to keep it upright at the same slow pace. This actually might have happened before we ran, but either way we began walking further away. Before we turned the corner, the bike changed directions and began heading south down the street that was east of us and by the co-op. The figure's arms were now and had been, since it had approached the bike, outstretched in a weird action figure-like stance with its upper arm slanted forwards, downwards, and slightly outward, and its forearms extending directly forwards. I wonder why the guy on the bike wasn't phased. For all I know, the figure was actually just a person in poor lighting. Or perhaps the guy on the bike was going slowly as he feared the figure would chase him if he went too fast too quickly. My friend thinks the figure was just a guy carrying water for the guy on the bike, but they stated that they never saw much of the figure whereas I noticed it more. Something doesn't seem right about that explanation. I couldn't tell if it was wearing clothes or not as the lighting was poor. I caught either light glimmering off its torso or a vague impression of a bluish shirt. But given the figure's proportions and the way it held something was off, the whole carrying water for bike guy theory doesn't seem right as it was just hunched over by the train tracks before it approached the guy on the bike, and it seemed to wander aimlessly around before approaching the guy on the bike. It seemed taller than normal for most humans too, but that could have just been my imagination. Here's a bit of the backstory. From late 2003 to the summer of 2005, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, and I lived in a haunted apartment in the Lakeview neighborhood of Chicago by the corner of Melrose and Broadway. When we first moved to this apartment, I often felt like I was being watched and sometimes had a sense of unease. But I was young, 23, when we first moved in and a senior in college, so I blamed the feelings on stress and the layout of the apartment, which was a typical Chicago 4 plus 1. We were on the second floor right over the garage, and our living room window faced the living room window of another apartment. That apartment and mine almost always kept the blinds shut. At the time, I did not believe in the paranormal. I'm the sort that has to see something myself before I believe it, and once I do see it, I analyze it endlessly. I went to bed one night, but as usual, could not fall asleep quickly. Our two cats normally went to bed with me, but they didn't on this night. After a while, I sat up in bed and looked out the bedroom doorway. I can see the dining room area from the bed, and if the cats were playing, they would inevitably end up in that area. Our apartment was very small, maybe 700 square feet if that and the dining area was kind of central to the apartment layout. I hoped I would see them so I could call them to me. It was dark, but not pitch dark, because the apartment's windows let in the dim light from our neighbors across the way, as well as typical large city light pollution. So, thanks to this light, my eyes quickly adjusted to the gloom. That's when I realized there was a very dark black, the blackest black you can think of blacker than black. Even like velveteen tar mass just passed where the apartment's very brief hallway ended and the dining area started. It was around seven feet high and had a rough head and shoulder, torso shape, but the rest of it kind of faded off. I wasn't alarmed at first, if anything I leaned forward to try to get a better look, because I absolutely couldn't believe my eyes. I was baffled. 
but when I leaned forward and gawked at this thing, it seemed to turn and look at me, and when it did, I saw two red eyes in the head. I did not see any other features, and I don't remember if the eyes were glowing or just plain red, but they were indeed red. When the thing looked at me, my amazement was quickly replaced by a deep, primal fear. And then it swooped through the bedroom doorway and towards me. I did the only thing I could think of, and that was duck under the covers like a kid hiding from the boogeyman. I have been in some scary situations in my life, but that particular fear was almost unearthly. The feeling reminded me of the intense terror you feel when you realize the monster in your nightmare has spotted you. After several moments I began to run out of air beneath the covers, so I decided to elbow my sleeping husband in the ribs hard enough to irritate him and make him wake up, sit up, roll over, do something. It worked, and when he didn't react strangely, I figured the thing was gone. And it was. I, and later my husband, saw the shadow again, but it never appeared remotely as threatening. Altogether, I saw the spirit there three times. It took me years to come to terms with this experience. The closest explanation I could come to was sleep paralysis, but other than the apparition looking similar to some of the hallucinations reported during sleep paralysis, there were no similarities to sleep paralysis. I had yet to fall asleep at that point and was able to move freely. The fact my husband later saw a black mass during waking hours and I saw something else when I was awake also helped me come to the conclusion that what I experienced wasn't due to sleep paralysis. With the assistance of the Chicago History Museum Research Center, I did research on the property and building. The apartment building was built in the early 1970s. Before that, a Jewish academy was on that site. Sometime before that, in 1940, a house that was on site burned down with no injuries or deaths. That house was once inhabited by a large family. One of their sons was a Marine that died of disease while deployed overseas during World War I. There's no record of the exact address prior to that. I also sent a message to the property management company asking if anyone has ever reported anything related to a haunting or the paranormal I had a hunch that the spirit moved throughout the whole building versus staying in my apartment and I fully expected either a no or no response from them. But to my surprise, the guy responding said he would check with people in the office and get back to me. A couple days later he said, Actually, I've been told that they were aware of the situation, but haven't had any reports of strange activity in a few years. Hope this helps. Fairly short story, and if anyone has any input on this, I'd love to hear it. For context, I live in a relatively safe area, but still on the cusp of a much less safe area. Anyways, I'd been out on a walk for a good couple hours and was walking along the sidewalk of a road at around 9.30 and completely dark out. Cars on this road are traveling about 40 miles an hour, sometimes a little more, and don't stop for a while until there's an intersection way back. Other than that, there is nowhere to turn or safely stop. I was walking on this path, passing occasional cars. I was not taking a route I'm very familiar with back home, so I looked at my phone for any upcoming paths I could take that would allow me to get home faster, without having to follow the road much further and ultimately have to walk longer. I saw a trail off the sidewalk that, and at the time of noticing it was coming up, I was a few hundred feet from it. I slowed to get to it and then walked a few yards onto the path. Given how dark it was, I was trying to take it on slowly but still at a walking pace. For a little bit I hadn't seen a car until then. I had heard it driving up on the right side side I was walking on, with the bike lane and an elevated sidewalk separating the driving lane. The car slowed slightly, but then came to a very abrupt stop a few yards ahead of where I had gotten off the sidewalk. Having heard the brakes and the sound of the car, I turned to look and saw the car stopped completely with the engine still running. The driver's door opened, which I could barely see because the passenger side was facing my direction. I didn't see anyone come out though. Upon seeing and hearing this, I immediately turned and sprinted into the dark. I ran on that path and it's a miracle I didn't trip and bite the dust. 
When I got out of the path, I ended up in a parking lot that led into a street, and from there I eventually figured out how to get back home by foot. I didn't see the car or anyone following me after that, so this is hardly an encounter. It was brief, and I'm not too sure what it was. My gut instinct was to just bolt and keep running until I felt safe enough to slow down. Anyways, if anyone has any thoughts on what this might have been, please don't shy from telling me your input and or if it's worth reporting. Benefit of the doubt, I'm saying maybe they thought I was lost, or it wasn't safe for me to be walking alone at night, but my gut was telling me danger. For details about the car if it's important. I'm not sure what model it was, but it was a boxy SUV and sort of looked like a copperish brown color. Maybe a Honda Pilot, but I only saw it for a couple seconds, so I can't be sure. The road stretched out ahead of me, a never-ending ribbon of asphalt disappearing into the horizon. My hands firmly gripped the steering wheel of my truck, the hum of the engine and the passing scenery my constant companions. It was just another night on the road, transporting Amazon products through the heart of Ohio. The radio played softly in the background, keeping me company on those long stretches of solitude. As the night grew darker, my headlights cut through the Nkai blackness, illuminating the highway ahead. I was lost in thought, my mind wandering as the miles ticked away. And then something caught my eye, a strange anomaly on the road ahead. It was far off in the distance, and at first, I thought it might be a trick of the light. But as I continued driving, curiosity got the better of me, and I found myself squinting to make out the shape. The figure came into focus, and a shiver ran down my spine. I saw a large dark silhouette walking upright. My heart raced as I instinctively slowed the truck down. What in the world could that be? My gaze remained fixed on the creature as I approached cautiously my foot easing off the gas pedal. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, a creature that seemed both out of place and out of time. As I got closer, my fear intensified and my instincts took over. I glanced around, searching for a place to hide. My eyes settled on a sturdy tree on the side of the road. With a rush of adrenaline, I pulled the truck over and scrambled out, my heart pounding in my chest. I positioned myself behind the tree, heart pounding, my breath held in anticipation. Turning my head slightly, I peered around the tree to catch another glimpse of the creature. It was closer now, perhaps only about ten feet away. Its size and shape were daunting, and its appearance was unnerving. The creature was completely black, a stark contrast against the moonlit night. It stood a bit shorter than me, with a hunched posture that seemed almost human. What struck me the most was the absence of a visible neck. Its head emerged directly from its broad shoulders. My eyes widened as I watched in horror as the creature reached the tree I was hiding behind. It lifted its head, its nostrils flaring as it sniffed the air, the nose pointing upward. I couldn't see any eyes, just an unsettling void where they should be. Time seemed to stand still, and I was frozen in place, my body refusing to obey my desperate commands to move. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature turned around. It moved with an eerie grace, almost casual in its departure. My breath hitched as I watched it retreat, disappearing into the darkness. I remained hidden behind the tree, my mind reeling from what I had witnessed. A sound shattered the stillness, tearing me from my thoughts. It was a guttural, unsettling noise that echoed through the night. My heart raced as I realized the creature had noticed me. The noise grew louder, a chilling shriek that seemed to cut through the very air itself. In an instant, the creature was no longer walking away. It was running towards the nearby woods, moving with an unsettling, human-like gait. I stepped out from behind the tree, my heart still pounding, my mind trying to process the events that had just transpired. And then, I saw it a grisly scene that further twisted my stomach into knots. The creature had left behind a gruesome tableau. A coyote lay on the road, its body torn open and partially devoured. The realization hit me like a punch to the gut this creature was a predator, a merciless hunter. My stomach churned, and a wave of nausea washed over me. I stumbled back, 
unable to tear my gaze away from the grisly sight. It was then that I made a silent promise to myself. I would never forget this night, and I would never drink alcohol again. The adrenaline-fueled fear had etched this experience into my memory, a vivid reminder of the strange and terrifying encounter on that desolate Ohio highway. I retreated to my truck, my hands trembling as I fumbled with the keys. The safety of the cab provided a small measure of comfort, but my mind was still racing, trying to come to terms with what I had seen. The road ahead stretched out, and I pressed my foot on the gas pedal, eager to put distance between myself and that haunting scene. As the miles rolled on, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had glimpsed something otherworldly that night. A creature that defied explanation, a living nightmare that had sent shivers down my spine. And though I was now on the move again, the memory of that creature and its chilling shriek would forever be imprinted on my mind. A reminder of the unknown dangers that could lurk in the shadows of the open road. I know this sounds weird, but about a week or so ago before this happened, I had a good buddy of mine who was also a motorcyclist who reported seeing strange things throughout this long stretch of road. He would often drive this area in the evening time and report feelings of being watched. I gave him a pretty hard time about it, thinking he was just being crazy, until I had my very own experience. When one evening after midnight I was running through here by myself, this has happened to me twice now. I'm not sure if this is the same being, but there are some details that seem to be similar enough for me to conclude that these are related encounters. It was Thursday evening in June of 1994. I was already a veteran here, having served in Desert Storm from 91 to 92. I was riding my motorcycle home from work around midnight that night. It was about a mile or so approximately right outside of Appomattox, Virginia, and I noticed something strange. I often came home late enough where it was dark and encountered headlights on the road coming towards me. But tonight, it seemed like there were none. Since this road is very heavily traveled, there are no crossroads. There should have been no cars out here at this time. As I pulled up to the crest of a hill and started to descend, approximately 300 to 400 feet from the crest, I saw something that nearly made me soil myself. I don't know how to describe what I was seeing, except that it looked like a giant upright walking ape, covered in hair, running along the road with its arms pumping furiously as it raced after my motorcycle. It kinda reminded me of a gorilla running on all fours, but also standing upright every now and then to try and gain full speed. The most frightful thing about it were its eyes. They were glowing this white yellow and they almost seemed to glow in the dark, the same way headlights illuminated a deer's eyes. It's as if they possessed their own light source. Now this thing ran after me for about a good 300 feet until I crested another hill, but when I looked back, it had vanished. It was almost as if the thing had just disappeared into thin air. In all honesty, it scared the crap out of me. And after thinking about it for a while now, I think this thing must have been traveling so fast it was chasing after the light from my motorcycle. That is what probably caught its attention in the first place. But the strange part about it all is that not once did I hear any noise coming from whatever this thing was. Even though it looked like a large gorilla running on two legs, it never really made a sound from what I saw from it. It was real ugly looking, like it was deformed or something and even had horns and pulled back like a ram's horns are. It also had this nasty smell like a skunk. Believe me or not, this is one story that won't leave me alone until I get it off my chest. It sounds pretty stupid to some people when you try to explain what happened. But if anybody has heard of similar encounters along these lines, please let me know. I do not know what this being is, where it came from. If anybody has any insight into what this thing was, let me know in the comments below. I am also aware there have been reports of strange creatures in this area, including Bigfoot sightings and strange otherworldly type encounters with UFOs and even other bizarre paranormal phenomena. But what in the world is going on around here? This stuff is scaring people, including me.
not intending to mock any religion or beliefs, and I really don't know which group this would be credited to anyway. Wiccans? Druids? Just a psycho. Anyway, I was hiking through a park in central Florida about three years ago. Kind of dense scrub brush. You can only see the trail in front of you. Brush is chest high on both sides. I'm about two miles from the nearest trailhead, and it's around 7 p.m. I had an hour of light left. I had intended on setting camp when I found the next clearing. First clearing I get to has a gator head in the middle with a circle of stones around it. Maybe two, three weeks old. Just a dried skull with scales. Soft tissue was gone. I had seen gator skulls left by poachers before, and I usually ignore it. But it gave me a weird vibe, so I kept walking. About 15 minutes later and deeper and I get to another nice-sized clearing. This time, a few dead birds were strung up to some sticks and hanging in a circle, like a mobile over a baby crib. Seven or eight small birds. Maybe four feet across. Had been there for a while. It didn't smell anymore, at least. Still creepy enough to send me on my way. Third time's the charm, right? Wrong. Twenty minutes later, and after taking to side paths to get away from the main trail, and hopefully avoid any other displays, I find a fresh one. A deer head on a stick. With sticks scattered around making four circles around the base of the stick. The blood was splattered all around the sticks. Fresh enough for the flies to still be on it. The head smelled rancid. Didn't see the body, but I didn't look for it either. I got out of there. I was dark before I got back to my truck. Called fish and game the next morning, because the gator and deer would have been taken out of season. Told them what I found and apparently this wasn't the first time somebody called about animal effigies in that park. Never went back, but I am curious just how many other shrines were out there. Not sure what it is. My girlfriend and I were hiking around Western Maryland, and I started getting an eerie feeling and I seen something following, stalking us, but it wasn't as big as what I've heard these dogmen to be. Also, there's a little equipment yard where I sometimes work on vehicles and behind the yard is a cornfield, and it had been cut down and in the middle of this field is an island of trees. While I was working one afternoon, I heard what sounded like 50 wolves howling at once. I turned around and seen something crouching down very low to the ground coming out of the island of trees. Looked a lot like the thing that had been following my girlfriend and I, but that was at least 20 miles away. Also, there's an area nearby where my father told me that he and his friends would see this wolfman thing running next to their vehicle in the 1960s, and supposedly had killed a lot of livestock in the area. I came across this article of something called the Snarly Yow. It was on the same mountain my father has all these werewolf stories about. I will try to upload the article for you. The area is around Hatcherstown, Maryland. I was hiking in the Barrington Tops, Australia, New South Wales, Australian state, and stopped at a place called Dead Horse Swamp. Lovely sight, got a drop toilet there which is a luxury and a waterfall nearby. Cut to night time and I had down my fire since it was bushfire season so I could go to sleep. Cut to a few hours later and I hear rustling and grunting. Thought it might have been a kangaroo or wallaby and shrugged it off. I had stored my food and supplies in the toilet block which had a lockable door so it couldn't attract animals. But I figured they must have smelt something. The rustling continues and I hear grunting and shuffling. So being the coward I am I freeze in my tent and pray that whatever it was doesn't come near me. Well it did and I hear this loud heavy breathing and grunting followed by heavy footsteps and at this point I'm shaking in fear. I start praying to any god that it have me and remain as still as I could. The thing went to the opening of my tent which had a flimsy little zipper to keep whatever it is outside and stopped. So I did what any grown man who is fearing for his life does, and I scream my lungs out. I hear a stampede of feet run away from the tent, and the rest of the night is quiet. I stayed up all night, and as soon as dawn hit, I made my way to my car and got the F out of there. 
Probably was a Bigfoot, but gee damn did I think it was Ivan Melot or Ted Bundy coming to skin me alive. After grad school, I moved into a house that my grandparents owned in rural East Georgia. They would visit every once in a while, but for weeks at a time, I was completely alone. This house is in the literal middle of nowhere and is on about 20 acres or so surrounded by woodlands. The property is at the end of an easement, off a dirt road, off a rural paved road, off of a state highway. I had a few neighbors, but the nearest house was over a mile and a half away. I wake up one morning to go for a run down the easement to the dirt road when I notice a set of unique, approximately sized 10 footprints going towards my house. I followed them all the way to the carport where they disappeared either onto the concrete or the grass. No one other than me had been at the house in almost two weeks. It had rained a few days earlier, which meant the tracks were discernible and relatively fresh. The door was locked and I was ready to run, so I decided to backtrack them to see where they originated from. I followed them six of a mile down the easement. I followed them eight of a mile down the dirt road to the intersection of the paved road where I lost the trail. They were definitely a one-way set of prints that ended almost a mile and a half down the road at my carport. I began to freak out. I called someone and let them know what I found in case I went missing. I returned to their vanishing point at the carport and attempt to track them through the grass. I'm not a skilled tracker by any means, but I hadn't cut the grass in a while and thought that I could follow them. Turns out I could. They went down the property line and into the woods. I followed them about 20 feet until I came to the creek that runs along the southernmost property boundary. The footprints clearly walked through the mud and into the creek. They didn't come out the other side. I checked up and down the creek side and couldn't find an exit point. Judging from the path the person took, they knew where they were going. There were no stopping points. There were no deviations in the direction, no moves in either direction, and no zigzagging. They walked from the paved road in a single direction down a dirt road and down an easement, along the edge of my house, down the tree line, and into a creek. Also, did I mention they were barefoot? The location of this story takes us to the Ozark Mountains, not in Arkansas, but in Missouri, about 12 miles from the town where I grew up. I was a cadet sergeant in the Civil Air Patrol. My team and I had just finished a late night training op. We were dropping off our camping gear at the field before heading back. I was walking out towards the rear of the van, where we had already begun climbing into our bunks to get sleep before we headed off to start the rest of our day in the morning. After about a minute, I had already turned off the headlights. I started hearing some distant howling. I happened to be facing towards the west, so I was looking out over the field where we were parked. The howling sounded like it was off in the distance on top of a mountain. Remember, due to the time, it was extremely dark, but I could sort of make out some shapes on the horizon. I'd recognize that hell anywhere. I spent my whole life and I grew up in that area and left only to go into the service. In the Ozarks, I've heard that howl too many times to count. It's the Ozark Heller, you know, where I grew up. If you've ever heard a hound like that in the distance, it meant one of two things. Either somebody's going out hunting and having a good time with beer, or the howler was on a spree. I immediately thought to myself, this is going to be bad. I was scared. I began scanning the horizon with my eyes, comparing what I could see of the shapes to mental images I've taken thousands of times of the terrain in my head. The last thing I wanted to do was be caught off guard. My heart sank in my stomach when I realized that the howls were coming from the west, from the base of the mountain range to the east of us. That meant that there was a very high probability that whatever it was down there was now heading our way. I called my friends into the vehicle and we started pulling all of our gear back out of the van, grabbing our rifles. I knew what was coming. We got our gear together, grabbed a couple of the M4s and hunting rifles with night vision scopes. We moved into a defensive position behind the van. Everybody else around me knew exactly what this was. 
Having most, if not all, of us around the vicinity of the Ozarks, we were all very familiar with the Ozark Heller. This was not a surprise to any of us. At the time, our location afforded us a very good view of the field in front of us. There were a few cottonwood trees in the middle of it, and a very small creek running along one side. The field was about a half mile in width, and about one and a half miles in length. We had a pretty good defensive position. We were behind the van, and the van itself was perpendicular to the tree line that ran alongside one of the fields. The trees were about 100 yards away from us. We had a very good field of fire. We had about a 180 degree angle of fire. Far back enough that we'd have surprise on our side, but close enough to the tree line that we'd be able to take some cover if something came at us from behind. The Ozark Howler had a very distinct howl. We knew that whatever was coming our way wouldn't be coyotes or feral dogs. We'd heard them both before, and they don't sound anything like the Ozark Heller. The howls were getting closer and were moving into formation. Making sure everybody had night vision, I was the only one with a thermal scope, which we could have used, but we didn't know what we'd be facing, and I had no idea how to even turn it on. So we were going with night scopes for the time being. As the howls got closer and the volume increased, we began to look for movement in the field. I was standing next to the driver's side window of the van, looking out over the field, while some of my friends were on the other side looking out over the tree line. I have to say, at this point, I was pretty jacked up. This thing had killed before, and it was coming for us. If it got to us, there'd be no escape. You have to understand, there was nowhere to go. It was either win or lose against this thing. I could hear it howling and getting closer, and we were watching the field intently. We saw some movement out of the corner of our eyes and turned to look at the tree line. I don't think anybody was prepared for what we saw when we looked in that direction. I remember it vividly, and the image is so burnt into my head. There were three of them. They were huge to begin with but the way they moved and how their muscles rippled under their fur was terrifying. They were some of the biggest wolves I'd ever seen, but they weren't wolves at all. Their fur was a dull gray, almost white, with speckles of what looked like black mud and filth all over them. The smell emanating off of them was very strong. It smelled like wet dog and urine. The thing is, when they saw us, it wasn't a surprise. They knew we were there. We all felt it without saying anything, and that's what really scared us. The fact that they knew we were there. They didn't care. They were hunting something else. When we saw them, they stopped and stood still. They were looking at us like we were a meal. I was looking into the thermal scope, and I could see some steam rising off of them. Now, I can't overstate how huge these things were, and when they turned their heads to look at us, it made me feel very small. I felt like a mouse looking at three lions. I'm not ashamed to admit that I was afraid. We were all pretty much shaking, and we didn't know what to do. One of them howled again, that same familiar howl, and we all knew that it meant something. I don't think anybody will ever say what we were thinking at that point, not out loud anyway. I knew what I was thinking, though. I'll tell you why. I thought about the stories of these creatures. It wasn't just the stories of the Ozark Heller. It was all these other stories from local legends and myths. I thought about how they were supposed to be huge wolves, and I thought about those bluffs not too far from here. They stood up and turned towards the bluffs and began moving towards them. They were moving fast. It was amazing the way they could move on the steep hills without slipping or falling. It didn't take us long to get back into the van and we drove off. I began reading about these creatures as much as I could, more than just hearing stories. I read about how they were supposed to be some kind of hellhound, tormenting people who live near them, and how they're supposed to have this blackness surrounding them. I have never seen something like this out there, but I can tell you what it looked like to me. They were some kind of hellhounds. There's no doubt in my mind. You know what, though? I still think about those things every day. I still think about that night, and I wonder what would have happened if they had not turned around. If they had decided to chase us and come after us, we'd all be dead. They would have killed us without a second thought. I've never been back to that spot, 
not even with all the equipment in the world. I don't think anybody could make me go back there. But if you do see one of these animals, I would advise you to stay far from it. I say this because if they wanted us dead, we would be dead. They turned their backs on us and walked away like we weren't even there. Beware the Ozark Heller. I was up on patrol in the mountains of New Mexico. I had hiked about four miles out of my way when I saw these prints. They were three toed prints that looked very clear. At first I maybe assumed they were bear tracks, but I got a closer look. They were too large to be an adult black bear. Right away I thought this might be something else. I was tracking these prints when all of a sudden they stopped in what looked like an old dried creek bed. It had nothing wrong with sagebrush growing all over. It was really weird to see no other prints on the trail for a while, and then all of a sudden these tracks just started up again, like whatever it was just levitated or sent it into the sky. I wonder if they were still fresh enough to have been made today. I couldn't tell. I kind of crouched down to see if I could smell anything, and radiating up off the tracks were this horrible musty death smell that you could only smell if you got within a couple of feet of the actual tracks. So I started tracking these from there, and it was clear that whatever this was had been going around in a route or a loop backtracking. That's when I came upon this section of pine. A lot of the trees in the middle were broken and torn. I eventually made my way back down, called my buddy, and asked him if he knew anything about what I had seen. He tells me he has also been receiving calls about strange things going on in these mountains. I can't exactly say what this was made by, but I can tell you now that this was no black bear walking on two legs. This was something much, much different. We're up against something that we don't even know what it could be. As the leader of our Navy SEAL team, I never imagined finding myself in such dire straits. The mission in Iraq had gone from bad to worse, leaving us stranded and cut off from any form of communication. Surrounded by hostile forces in the heart of enemy territory, my team and I were on our own, relying on our training, resourcefulness, and unbreakable camaraderie to survive. We pressed on, navigating through treacherous terrain, always on the lookout for any sign of danger. Our hope was fading as each passing moment brought us closer to the brink of despair. It was during one of these tense moments that we stumbled upon a deserted cabin nestled deep within the woods. With no other options, we decided to take refuge there, hoping to regroup and come up with a plan. As we approached the cabin, a sense of unease settled over us. The air seemed to grow thick with an eerie tension, and a feeling of being watched sent shivers down my spine. We cautiously entered the cabin, our weapons drawn and ready for any threat that might present itself. But nothing could have prepared us for what we encountered. In the dim light of the cabin, we saw it an unknown creature. Its overlong arms hung nearly to the ground, each finger tipped with eight-inch razor-sharp claws that glinted ominously. The creature's body was covered in a silver-like sheen of hair, and its size 35 human-like hairy feet left imprints on the cabin floor. Its head, however, was the most unsettling part resembling that of a grizzly bear, with a snout marred by deep scars that told stories of battles with beings even larger than itself. Despite its terrifying appearance, what struck me the most were its piercing blue eyes that seemed to hold the weight of centuries within them. Confusion and fear gripped us, and in our panic, we opened fire. The creature shrieked, a haunting sound that reverberated through the cabin, and before we could react, it lunged at us. The chaos that followed was swift and brutal, resulting in the loss of five of our team members. We fought for our lives, desperation fueling our every move until finally, we managed to overcome the beast. As the creature lay dead before us, its once fearsome exterior now lifeless and still, we couldn't help but feel a mixture of relief and awe. What had we just encountered? And would anyone back home even believe our account of the creature's existence? With a heavy heart, we knew we had to press on. Inspecting the carcass revealed clues that the Iraq rebel arm was dangerously close. 
We couldn't afford to linger any longer. We made the difficult decision to withdraw, leaving the cabin and its secrets behind as we continued our journey toward the extraction point. Finally arriving at our designated location, exhaustion and uncertainty washed over us. We looked at one another, a silent question hanging in the air what had we just faced. Would General believe our story, or would our encounter with the unknown creature be dismissed as a hallucination born from the stress of battle? As we waited for extraction, the weight of our experience settled upon us, a reminder that even in the midst of war, there are mysteries that defy explanation and horrors that test the limits of our understanding. It was mysterious to me. I was in federal prison and for four months I was in the hole. 23 hours locked in the cell and then one hour out. But that's only five days a week, so it's 24 hours on the weekends. And it was winter, and the one hour is usually at 6 a.m., and you only have a jumpsuit and flip-flops, so you choose to not go outside at all. You're locked in a cell for weeks at a time. You think about everything, everything, all the things you'll do when you get out, that business you want to start, that food you want to eat, that chick you want to hook up with, every good thing you've done, the bad things you've done, the women again, the ones you've been with, the ones you want to be with, and then you run out of things. There are no more things to think about. You can't remember them if there are. Then it starts, a spark in your mind, a rhyme. Is that from a song? Who is that? I can't remember the name. Let me try to think of the rest of it. Maybe the chorus, and then more lines and more rhymes. You realize this is a new song that is forming in your mind. Why these words? Why this topic? I need to find something to write with. And some paper. I have an envelope somewhere. It pours out. Line after line. Rhyme after rhyme. Stanzas, choruses, bridges. Alliteration, puns, euphemisms. Not one song. Song after song. I can hear them being sung. I can hear them on the radio. Wait. Hold on a second. Are these songs already out and I am just writing them down? Did I forget that I heard these songs before? I don't play an instrument. I am not musically minded. Sometimes it would take me 20 minutes to write an entire song. I'd daydream the entire thing into existence. Sometimes longer. And the ones that I couldn't finish right away, I could still feel them inside me. There was something there. Something I tried to not force. I could tell there was more and I just had to wait and relax and it would come to me. As if the lyric had already been written and I just had to align myself with the right frequency. I got out of prison two months ago. I have all the songs. I hope to do something with them. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.